Sēdo, skanē kaut. In your house, scan up the hall here, get that with a slana. What I said primarily in English from the Mohawk is, Hi, how are you? I hope that you come in peace. My name is He Waits. I am Mohawk Turtle Clan. And I come from the land where the partridge drums. So my name is Mike Tarbell. I am the educator here at the Iroquois Indian Museum. I've been here almost 25 years, if not a little bit more. And uh, the Iroquois Museum is a very special place for me. Um, I use it as a platform to basically present my ancestors to you in a better light. Better than the way that they're portrayed to you in your written history books and stuff. So I learned, uh, started learning uh, Native history, my history, uh, when I was quite little. I guess you could say around eight or nine years old. And uh, this was provided for me by my grandmother. And uh, she was a medicine person. And um, she would take me with her when she gathered the medicines. And she would answer any questions that I would have. But the most important thing that she did for me was provide a moment that I could spend with my grandfather. And, uh, and the friends that used to come to visit him uh, during the summer times. Uh, usually after Grand Council, uh, my grandfather would sit in Grand Council, put everything to memory. My grandfather couldn't read or write a lick, but he had total recall and a photographic memory. And so, because we're so dispersed today uh, through maybe 16 or 17 communities, that not everyone can make the Grand Council meeting. So the weekends following that, I witnessed these old men coming to visit my grandfather. And he would give them the Grand Council meeting word for word. But the most important time for me uh, would be when the sun went down and now all business was put away and this became a social moment. And my grandmother uh, would provide the molasses cookies and the milk. And I would eat the cookies and drink the milk and then I'd listen to these old men talk about the days of their grandfather's grandfathers. And so, the title that I hold today in my nation is that I am a storyteller. And that's a little bit different understanding than what you understand as a storyteller today uh, in your culture. Uh, when you talk about somebody being a storyteller, um, usually there's someone that's not telling the truth or telling lies. But in my culture, we are the keepers of the histories. And the reason we are storytellers is because the children will listen to a story. And so this is how I learned uh, our history. It never quite married up with the histories that I learned in school. After school, I'd go home and my grandpa would ask me, well, what'd you learn today? And stuff, and when we got into the historical aspects uh, of my people, then uh, he had another story to tell me. And uh, so in this moment, basically the information that you find between the two hard covers in the library on my people, the people that you call Iroquois, and the people that we call ourselves, the Haudenosaunee, the people of the Long House. About 40, maybe 45% of that information is erroneous. And so I teach that history here at the local college, Cobleskill. And what I do is I have that moment to straighten out that history just a little bit. And like I said, an opportunity to present my ancestors to you in a better light. So through my growing up days and stuff of being exposed to these elderly men and the stories that they had, I learned a lot. And in that moment too, uh, although I didn't understand it as stereotyping or anything, but the people that they would talk about. And in time, when uh, in that growing up moment, I had my own stereotypes and stuff. And so for an example, um, when I started playing baseball and I had, um, my dad would say, oh, you're, you're like your great uncle Joe. And I didn't understand that because I never met my great uncle Joe. Uh, he passed away uh, about five years before I was born. And uh, also uh, listening to him when I started playing football and he talked about his father, my grandfather having played football. And again, it was a history that I didn't know about, not until 
actually when we did a, an exhibit here at the museum on Indians and baseball. And so it gave me that moment to uh, journey on down to Carlisle, uh, where the industrial school was, where uh, Native students and a lot of my uncles went to, uh, great uncles went to, uh, in that moment. And I found pictures of my Uncle Joe when he played baseball for uh, the Hershey Chocolate Company. And then also, um, the, uh, there was a, a, a town south of Carlisle, and uh, he played summer ball there playing baseball, and he also, like I said, played for the Carlisle Indians uh, and stuff. My Uncle Joe was a pitcher, and uh, he was left-handed, and his claim to fame will be that when Pop Warner took the Indians up to play baseball at West Point, his brother uh, was the coach at West Point, and uh, he wanted to know what kind of, who did he have that was going to uh, play against his army machine and stuff, and he pulled out uh, my great uncle Joe, uh, and he said, this is my pitcher. And he was about 14 or 15 years old, I think. And they played baseball that day, and my great uncle Joe uh, pitched the game that the Army that day. Um, I found a picture of my grandfather also playing football. Now, my grandpa was, he was a big man, kind of walked around, uh, kind of heavy-footed. Uh, I never ever thought that uh, he uh, could run or anything like that until I saw that picture of him playing football at Carlisle, just before Jim Thorpe gets there. And uh, my grandpa was mean and lean, and that picture showed me that he could run like the deer uh, and stuff. So these were the imageries or the stereotypes that I had. As I progressed in uh, the athletics then, naturally I took an interest in Jim Thorpe. And Jim Thorpe became my stereotype of an athlete and so I kind of covered a lot of different sports instead of just one. So I was a track athlete, I was a football player, I played baseball, uh, I played basketball uh, and stuff. So I tried to be good at everything. And uh, like I said, at the same way that Jim Thorpe uh, was. When my son was growing up, uh, his stereo, uh, stereotype uh, image of uh, a runner was uh, um, Billy Mills. So my, my son was a long runner and stuff, and he became, he was number four in the country at that time uh, and everything, the steeplechase uh, and everything. So stereotypes uh, that we would have uh, were correct the way that we saw that. It's unfortunate that during that time of my growing up years that we didn't have a lot of uh, TV channels like you got today that present a lot of uh, programs to you. We only had one or two channels, and basically you had to accept what was being played. Uh, it was also the early moments of um, the movies uh, becoming uh, movies that you could actually hear sound in uh, and everything. And so what was a lot of movies were the country western movies, uh, Indians, cowboys and Indians. And, and so the imageries that came out of that um, never quite married up with the imageries that my grandfather and my grandmother presented to me uh, in my growing up moments and stuff. So um, in that way, uh, today, now probably in the beginnings, those stereotypes, maybe, maybe there was good intention, but over the years, they've kind of, that good intention has kind of uh, been clouded a little bit uh, in everything, like, uh, the Atlanta Braves, the Tomahawk Chop, uh, things like that. These were things that were just uh, put on us and stuff. I learned a different image of the warrior uh, and everything. So even in my moment of growing up, there was a moment when I thought about myself uh, becoming a great warrior uh, and everything. So I learned a lot about how the native uh, the warrior presents himself and then how he's treated by the rest of of the, uh, the community uh, in its own right uh, and everything. So a lot different than the way that they, like I said, they're portrayed in movies uh, and everything. My own experience uh, of stereotyping, uh, more than likely, uh, came in my military service. And that moment um, when uh, I was in North Carolina at Fort Bragg, and um, one of the guys, 
Now, I told everyone, you know, that I was Native American. They wanted to know who I was. You know, I wasn't Spanish or anything, and I wasn't Mexican. Uh, although there was one guy that looked exactly like me and stuff. We had the same coloration, skin coloration and stuff, but he was Mexican and stuff. So, what are you? You know, I'm an Indian. I'm a Mohawk Indian. Uh, one weekend, I got invited home. Uh, one of the guys that was a driver, actually, for the uh, company commander, and uh, he wanted to invite me to his, his home on that weekend. And uh, that night, uh, we went to a gathering at the local high school, <laughs> and they were burning crosses, and I didn't understand what that was, you know, what they were doing. And this guy came out dressed up in a, in a robe and, and uh, stuff and started talking to the people and how they were declaring war against the Indians and everything. And I looked at my buddy Charlie and I said, Charlie, I says, I'm an Indian. And he looked at me and he says, no, you're not an Indian. I says, Charlie, I've been telling you all along, I'm a Mohawk Indian. And he looked at me and he says, he says I don't know. He says, I can't believe that. He says, your hair is not kinky. And so that was the stereotype of Indians that they would have in North Carolina uh, and stuff. So the um, good images, bad images, uh, like I said, through my growing up years, uh, when I was in, in Vietnam, once they learned that I was an Indian, then I was put out on the point. And the point is usually out ahead of the infantry unit itself. And your job on the point is to basically detect the, uh, the enemy before they can uh, you know, get after you uh, and everything. So a lot of stuff that I learned as what was a good warrior, I learned from my grandpa and his friends and how they talked about that. And naturally, Vietnam was a different war. It was a, a war, um, like I said, all wars they say are the same but different in certain aspects and stuff. And so out on the point, I felt very much at home. I felt good about being there. I understood what my job was. And, but I never quite understood why they put me on the point, you see. Later on, when I'm serving with the Pathfinder unit, uh, my unit commander came up to me and said, well, we need to send somebody out there with the mountain people and we believe you're the man for that job you know, and everything because you're an Indian and you're the indigenous peoples of Southeast Asia. And so, again, you know, I was stereotyped, but what came of that moment was that those people looked at me and they saw something and they said, who are your people? And I said, well, I'm an Indian, a Native American. And said, oh, and the nurse that was there who was my nurse, she said, well, who are your people? And I said, well, I'm a Mohawk. And she looked at me and she says, oh, she says, upstate New York. And I'm completely over on the Cambodian border. And she started telling me about my people. And she looked at me and she said, you're one of us. And it took me a while to understand that. But after a while, I learned that I was one of them and that they were teaching me things that uh, they only wanted to share with me. And it became the most serene, nurturing time of my life in the middle of a war, living with these people and stuff. And so um, that was, um, like I said, there's a lot more that I would like to talk about uh, and everything, but it's not until this moment that I really had a chance to kind of step back and, and take a look at that, uh, the stereotyping. And we've got good, we've got bad, uh, and everything. So, But my duty and my goal as an educator here and at the local colleges, like I said, giving you the best image of my people, that you would understand who my people are and who we are today and then how we see ourselves in this creation. We're not that far apart in our understandings. As like my grandma said, if you put everybody in a circle and you put something in the middle, everyone's looking at the same thing, but each of them will see it a little bit differently than the next.